Okay, uh, we are talking and uh, we, we talked in our meeting about machine learning and application to brain imaging, sometimes too much about machine learning. But now let's see uh, something even weirder, quantum machine learning. Uh, I know some people are against buying uh, new hardware, uh, thinking that new hardware will not improve their uh, research results, but this is totally on a different level. I wonder what the prices for quantum computers are now on uh, new egg and whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, let's go ahead. Is it true that you can want to crash because of like a crypto? That's a good possibility. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Spell down. So, quantum computer and quantum machine learning. Uh, we all know how popular it's machine learning. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's afraid of AI taking control of humans and so on. And something similar is happening in the field of physics generally everywhere when we encounter a lot of quantum. So people are afraid that quantum algorithms can break, uh, say, encryption uh, in a feasible time. Quantum cryptography states that they can create a perfect cryptographic keys that can be intercepted and so on. And when you mix two, it's a fundamental saying about the thing you get high, high comments. Uh, I have to say, studying and reading about it was somewhat troublesome because everywhere I was looking at, um, I was encountering some limitations, some uh, remarks about uh, the algorithms that might be working well on paper, but they won't actually work in the real world. And there was a lot of them. So, before we start talking about quantum machine learning, we, uh, I think it's good to say a few words about what is quantum computing. Uh, quantum computing or quantum computers can be separated in two types. Uh, first type is a general purpose quantum computers. It's the counterpart of classic computers like you have here, most of us. And another type is analog quantum computers or uh, specialized purpose uh, processor and don't solve special problems. Uh, We'll talk about the second later, and let's start with the general purpose quantum computers. So, general purpose quantum computers try to mimic the classic computers, meaning they also try to use some extrapolation of bits to the quantum field, while classic computers use bits, which can take states 0 and 1. Quantum computers can take quantum states 0 and 1, and a single qubit can be in both of those states simultaneously. Uh, in the mathematical <coughs> language, it means that it belongs to the space of vectors in C2. More specifically, it belongs to the space of vectors in C2 with the length one. And quantum computers also trying to extrapolate the logic case using classic computers to the quantum level. Uh, only while in classic computers, uh, logic gates are variations like and or not and so on. In quantum computers, those operations are instead uh, the basis of matrices in a two by two dimensional matrix. Since quantum computers rely on quantum mechanics, it is important to say a few words about measurements in quantum mechanics. Uh, so, for example, let us have some qubit in a superposition of two states. And say we want to actually measure or find in which state if, uh, the uh, constants A and B of this state. To do that, we need to perform measurements of this qubit. Uh, measurements in quantum mechanics are best, best described by uh, projections and projector operators. 
So for example, if you want to find out if qubit is in state zero, we need to project it on state zero. Uh, can I give you some photo or something? Yeah, so this is the operation of projecting quantum needs on a state zero. Can I ask you, since you come from physics background, can I ask you what actually is happening in quantum computers? Is it polarization? Are they measuring the orthogonal components of polarization of the wave, or what are they doing? Or what do they mean by projection? I think it depends on the hardware used for quantum computer because there isn't a single one like we have in classic computers, the superconductive semiconductors technology. In quantum mechanics, quantum computing, people are studying uh, if they can use photons or electrons bound to some state. Uh, the measurement of those are, in, say, for in case of electron based on computers, it's a measure of a spin of the electron mm. and like that. Uh, however, there is a certain limitations to measurements and the computing derived from quantum computers. Uh, because first, to actually find the exact state, we need to gather statistics. Because when we use a projection, a measurement a single time, we can only find if the qubit is in the state zero or it isn't. And to find the actual probability of this qubit being in the state zero, we need to gather statistics and there are the probabilities from it. Another problem is that uh, measurements in quantum mechanics actually change the state of the measure system. So if we found the state is as is in the zero one, then from now on it is in zero one for sure. And if the qubit we well, we have measured is some result of computations, it means that to repeat the measurement, we have to repeat the computations from scratch. And it adds to the complexity. So can you explain uh, or or I can try. Uh, because this sounds magical, but uh, the only thing here is that measurements are destructive. When you measure the thing, you destroy it because a wave or an electron is absorbed by your detector. That's what happened. That's it. There's, it doesn't exist anymore. It's not like now it is forever in a zero state. No, you have absorbed it. Oh, that actually can still exist in its state. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to create quantum computer leads if its qubits were destroyed during measurements. But how do you, so photon definitely gets destroyed, right? Uh, it gets uh, absorbed by a detector. Yeah, uh, yeah. you definitely use perturb the system, yeah. No, well, perturb, it's, you have to absorb the photon right. to create, to change the energy of your detector. Uh, but what about the electron? I think it, it is absorbing, absorbed too, but uh, well, electron can go through a conductor, say, and create uh, and come back to the system or something like that. Like, I'm, not, I'm not sure like what is happening there. Any, anyone, we have two physicists that can appeal to, uh, if, if you know what is actually happening. Otherwise, this is kind of magical. Well, it's on the math side more than it's on the experimental side. Yeah, on the mass, we can assume, okay, the unicorns like that exist, and this is how we deal with it. Yeah. But I, I kind of feel more comfortable when I have a physical model for a physical system rather than. Yeah, well, I mean, I think just the goal for quantum in general is the more understanding of that, the better. But... but they actually measure stuff, so that's what I want to know. How do they measure? They're not operating mathematically in those quantum computers. They're not simulating them. It's there. So, yeah. well, anyways, go. I, I, I it's see what it's done for, but yeah, it's abstract somehow. Some, I've heard that like some of the quantum machines have like actual like 
biological molecules that are like melanin or something like this, like like some chemical that's like produced in the pituitary gland or something like this, etc. Or something. Maybe it's just from the skin. I probably think mixing up melanin and melatonin, but I don't know. You can make a comment because a lot of people say because it is some quantum properties. Yeah. The question is if it will be stable or not. And formulas are pictures or text? <coughs> formulas are pictures. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's very <laughs> <this slide there. laughs> You can format it with LaTeX. It's not a, a picture. It is an art. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> right. If you're doing OCR, it is. So. So let's talk about a few advantages uh, that are originated from the form and nature of quantum computers. First, uh, because of the superposition property, in theory we can uh, take L qubits and put each of them in a superposition of states zero and one. That would translate into the L qubits being in a two L minus one states at once, meaning from zero to two L minus one integers at the same time. It would it might mean that uh, we can actually encode in a single quantum qubit set a whole data set. And a holdout set? A holdout? Or holdout uh, Like an additional set? Yeah, entire data set. Yeah. <laughs> and if we have some function that works on those integers from 0 to 2 to the power of L minus 1 and map them on some other integer space, uh, we can uh, match to a certain operator or matrix in space to this function. That would um, mimic the function we are working with. Uh, yeah, that's this equation is. Sorry. The equation is uh, the slide in a quantum. In a qubit representation, they say that. So since we know that we can uh, put up qubits in all states at once, in theory we can uh, compute the um, function f for all integers at once. And it is called quantum parallelism. Uh, however, there is a limitation to that. Uh, because you can't extract more bits of classy data than you have uh, qubits. That's probably going to be like more than you wanted to go into, but like, is there a quick way to explain superposition? I don't remember exactly what superposition is. Superposition is um, the ability of quantum states to be in a superposition of two uh, states, real yeah. states. So if qubit has two states, you know, well, basic states, it can be in superposition of them at once. So it's like some state between? Uh, yeah, if you imagine that. Is, is it related to things like the double slit experiment or Schrodinger's cat? Yeah. I think it's more of a Fourier transform. I think yeah, it is yeah. similar. Let's not go into Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> that's, how it, that's how it works physically, right? No, it's no, it's a joke. The Schrodinger <laughs> cat is no, actually a joke. Actually, more well, it's an allegory, more right? <laughs> no, but like it's Fourier. It's like you can you can put many frequencies in. Well, it's not like Fourier, but it's a transform. Hmm? It's a transform. It follows the linear canonical <laughs> transform. You can Fourier transform. No, the linear canonical transform. Follows what? 
it follows the linear canonical transform, which is the grandparent transform for Laplace, Fourier, but it's not Fourier, right? Because Fourier is a specific kind of transform. Yeah, yeah, but this is a specific kind of transform. Frequency is yeah. mixed. But you can replace the uh, polynomials in the LCT with uh, the same polynomials that you can inject into this. But the, the polynomials being the gates. But those are actual waves, right? Those are like the 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 yeah, there's there's of the waves. waves. Yeah, they're mixed. Yeah. So that's why Fourier transform is appropriate rather than any other generalization. <sighs> Not but, really, right? Well, because it's the Fourier transform is a well-defined transform, and this too. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Heisenberg uncertainty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all the gates operate as two by two matrices, right? But the weights in those gates, uh, you can replace the polynomials in the LCT with set weights. Okay, maybe. Yeah. It's done. It's done. Draw a picture about superposition. Is it kind of like the, what the state is in before you Freedom project it into like the matrix? Yeah, yeah, you can see the state is the power on the circle. Okay. Only as a system. What's the building? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but this is like linear algebra. Uh, the yeah. what you draw. Uh, yeah. I see this kind of kind of explains why. Quantum computing can be better than classic computer because its basic operations are linear algebra. This is explain anything to me, but okay. <laughs> yeah, we found out that quantum parallelism is possible, but it's linear. So unless you want to actually do to the power of L minus one computations, you can't extract more than L qubits, L bits of classic information from L qubits. Uh, due to quantum nature, there are some limitations also. Uh, one of them is so called no cloning theorem. Uh, it states that if you have some arbitrary unknown quantum state, say you got it obtained it from computations. Can simply create a copy of it. Uh, you actually have to measure it so that you know the actual state and then can reproduce it. That is quite not what is happening in classic computing because you can always uh, fork your wire and get uh, the copy of your bit. Classically, yes. Yeah. Quantum it is impossible. You can't fork your logic circuits. You have to do something else. Uh, and while actually, while it's a limitation for quantum computing, it is the basic thing that lies in uh, that lies in the basis of quantum cryptography. Because given that you can't copy a an unknown state, you can send it to your receiver. And then if you do it enough times, you can statistically define, find out if uh, your signal was intercepted or not. So it makes kind of unbreakable uh, cryptography. We finally get to the content of it. So, do you understand what you just said? Like, uh, yeah, we can. Can I ask questions about it? So, you're saying, okay, uh, in cryptography, because to, but the same thing, because the measurements are destructive, once you measure the information, it doesn't get to where it was sent to. Right? <laughs> That's how you can detect that you're being tapped uh, or listen to. And in quantum computer, we need to measure. It's quite opposite. We need to be able to read out the 
and it's forming quantum fields. Yeah, so either one exists or another. Either quantum computers are possible or cryptography is possible. No. The non point theorem is just a theorem that then applied to quantum computing uh, puts some limitations to it. But just as with any physical property, you can use it for your advantage if you come up with a idea how to do that. So we need to create a state run it through the circuit and then we measure that state in the computer to bet that leave it out by which we destroy it but we got a result yeah. and then we again create a new state input encode our problem in that state run it through our problem solving circuit and measure it out again destructively so that that's what you mean right that uh, we can measure it we can't clone it and like send it over internet, but we can measure it once and write down on the paper when when we're measuring it or something like that. Okay. Uh, we actually get into the content of the paper. Um, so in this paper, they're discussing several methods, several algorithms that can be performed on the quantum computer that could actually be faster than the, their classical counterparts. Um, there are some limitations to those uh, methods, as you can see in the remark below. But generally, uh, it is believed that if we find a good problem for them, quantum algorithms can give us an exponential speed up compared to classic computers. Those in the applications for uh, Machine learning, those methods are quantum PCA, quantum support vector machine, and the different linear algebra subroutines that can be speed up. Like Fourier transform quantum eigenvalue uh, estimation algorithm and solve the linear systems of equations. Before we actually talk about them, let's uh, mention a few fundamental problems to those. So quantum computers are working very well, very exponentially when you don't actually look at what they do. Unless they are left alone, they to make them actually useful, you need first to somehow feed them the data. And to feed them the data, you need to project uh, classic data into a quantum state that can be exponentially difficult if you are right. So, stinky hacks. Uh, another problem is the optical problem. It's actually the reading that since you, since your measurements are destructive, you have to perform many measurements to actually find the uh, result of your computations, unless you come up with an idea how to size like that and somehow reduce the data you obtain from the computer into lower dimensions, and then you have to make less measurements to actually find it out. Uh, the, second, the third problem is the problem of the cost. Since quantum algorithms are mainly developed on paper so far, uh, it is not really clear if we can implement them on a real hardware in a way that wouldn't break all the advantages the quantum computing gives us. For example, we can you might have to construct logic case that need to be exponentially big to perform some operation. Uh, if it is the case, then our exponential speed up is not that. And with the fourth problem is the problem of benchmarking. So uh, quantum algorithms again mainly develop on paper. Um, we can put bounds to their complexity, but 
we haven't really tested them on real compute on real quantum computers because they don't exist yet. And if we want to simulate quantum processes behind those computations on the classic computer, we might have to do a lot of computations. And before we can do that, we can't actually say the quantum algorithms will be really efficient. Okay, that's the whole problem. So, so this paper, we are mostly discussing uh, these two quantum algorithms uh, for machine learning, quantum PC and quantum support vector machines that can be uh, implemented on a general purpose quantum computer. Uh, let's first talk about the algorithm for solving uh, linear equations. At this point, I'm afraid I have reservations whether uh, the paper was written accurately or not. Because, let's see. They are stating that uh, quantum algorithm for solving linear equations uh, can be performed in the complexity ego log n squared. And they are comparing it to the complexity of a uh, best classic algorithm uh, ego of n log n. When I was searching literature, I couldn't actually find such an algorithm. Have you heard anything about it? Well, again, it's too good. Uh, they might be dropping some, some, um, just for the sake of comparison. I'm afraid I can't really explain how they work because I've to go to almost a month and uh, I nearly got to the level that I understand what is written, but I can't really explain it to other people, unfortunately. Nonetheless, the statement that a quantum algorithm can be, can have a, for solving linear systems of equations can be exponentially faster. However, it has a few caveats. Uh, first, for this algorithm to work, you need to map your data into a quantum state. Input program that can break all the advantages. Second, we need to obtain the result of the computations, and it can be uh, exponentially hard to unless you find out how to size that. And it also says limitations to the matrix A of the linear system. So you can solve any linear system equations. There are actually a fourth target which uh, states that uh, in a certain article, people actually tried to simulate this algorithm and didn't find the exponential speed up that is stated here. So that's the problem of benchmarking. I think when your really nice uh, theoretical algorithm actually works. Not as good in a real world. However, <coughs> I should I think we should mention that since many machine learning algorithms rely on linear algebra, this is kind of important for quantum machine. It's quantum PCA. Again, the program complexities, um, I'm not sure how they derive them, but nonetheless, they're stating that uh, they can perform PCA in an exponential less time than a classic algorithm. Uh, yeah, and again, I can't really explain. Finally, the quantum support vector machine. So it is not, I think it is not really clear how to estimate the complexity of support vector machine uh, because it depends on the data you're providing. 
but there are a few quantum algorithms that can be used in the process of support vector machine work uh, that can actually speed it up. First of them is a um, method for search in a and size database that can be formed in a square time compared to the classic algorithms. And if you want to find S entries in the database, you can perform it in a square root of n divided by S time or variations. So that's one approach to enhance support vector machines. Another approach is that Support vector machines heavily rely on linear algebra and many quantum um, algorithms for linear algebra provide uh, exponential speed up, like the HHL algorithms that, that are here. So, yeah, that's all for general purpose quantum. And uh, it's worth it to say that general purpose quantum computers are now uh, not really developed. The best um, computers are uh, given, uh, the people are able to actually construct the system. So, it doesn't seem to give this, and it is not very applicable for real problems. However, in quantum mechanics, we can construct a special purpose computers or analog computers. They can be actually much easier to construct, much easier to make whole proof, and so on. You know, in real world applications. Uh, let's consider one time a box machine. In classic, Machine board Poisson machine is a kind of recurrent neural network. Uh, each of the nodes in this network uh, connected with others bidirectionally. Nodes can take uh, values from zero to one. And uh, we can feed data to this machine and optimize it so that uh, probability of this data generated by a train Boltzmann machine is maximized. So we are training it to generate data that we are feeding. It is expressed in a few equations that are usually often encountered in physics, namely the Boltzmann distribution, the exponential decrease probability of some state is high energy. And in case of uh, Boltzmann machine, we can actually express this energy in an equation. This energy would depend on the weights that describe interaction between different nodes and the weights of the nodes themselves. And training Boltzmann machine means actually finding the optimal set of those weights that maximize the probability. Uh, it can be shown that this problem can be marked, translated to a problem of maximizing an object function that looks like that. And the problem is with this function is that um, with the increase of the nodes in Boltzmann machine, it becomes an exponentially difficult problem. And for this is where we might try to design some analog computer that could uh, perform this optimization based not on the computational algorithms, but the physical laws. And consequently, if you can construct a uh, classical physics machine that can mimic it, then you can construct a quantum analog of this machine. Um, from a certain D wave relations or something like that, the company from Canada, they are stating that they can construct such kind of machines that implement the quantum annealing uh, in the 
this a kind of optimization now way. Um, that actually really looks like the problem the balls of machine optimization looks like. Um, in this in this article, they are showing the results of some simulations of this algorithm that shows that it can be trained rather fast, but not given comparisons to the classical algorithms. That's it. Cool. I think we already want to cycle in though, where you explain uh, how the how the how it works to get the physical layer. How do they store things? How the computation is done in more depth. But into okay. problems actually first uh, understanding how they are. Uh, quantum operations they are using for this. Uh, so quantum operations they are using for the because they are using rather strange things like uh, matrix exponential uh, things like that. And once I understand that, I'm also going to explain how that works. And it seems like It'd be nice to be clear about how the structure, how, how they're overcoming the destructive nature of observation or the storage in particular. It seems like as soon as you like surveys mentioned several times that they, um, that how are they overcoming that? Because they're clearly building upon that for encryption, but they seem to have to overcome it somehow just to have like something resembling, something resembling a computer. The quantum computers, uh, the destructive nature of measurements can be sensed up if you come up with a way to reduce the pain data on the quantum algorithm, just like that you can uh, measure it on a few iterations. For example, if your quantum algorithm for solving linear equations gave you some solution vector x. And do many measurements on X to actually find it out. Sometimes you don't really need it. Maybe you just want to find out its scalar product with itself. You can do that. You know, find it out in a much less iterations. So they're sampling the state several times in a sort of stochastic way, like they might get the wrong answer, but they're using redundancy to overcome the stochasticity. Is that kind of right? Is a bit applicable to this level for other problems. Do you have any comments? No, I like to talk. No, but I thought some kind of linear transformation can solve all this. Uh, so that's what they are, right? They're just two. So the Hadamard gate is one specific. Right, and that's also a specific transform. That's how they model, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, that's that is computational what the gate is. That's what these transform are. They operate on the momentum and position. Uh, the, well, they are the momentum and position operators on your qubit, which is represented by this two by one vector. Um, I guess it works when you have spin, right? right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's how we understand the vector. So you only operate on the spin. Spin is your physical yep. qubit. Yeah, but we have two operators generally: momentum and position. That operate on the quantum state. Because spin, I don't think is actually spin. You know what I mean? I don't think that it has all the properties of spin. I just call it that. I and I, maybe it's conceptually similar. But yeah, uh, it's similar by the behavioral, right? Like that's yeah. it behaves like something is spinning. So that I guess that's why they call it spinning. I mean, I don't know. I uh, I'm not a quantum physicist or a quantum particle. That's easier than you can talk to <laughs> Yeah, what would the what would the quantum particle say here? Uh, it would think we are all wrong. 
Doesn't any more take advantage of spin? Like, doesn't it have to like energize? Sorry, what was the first part of the question? Doesn't MRI yeah. take advantage yeah. of spin? It does. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we measure. Yeah. So basically, like they, they add energy to the system. So yeah. like so the spin is oriented in so one direction. Yeah, it's oriented differently. And then how long it relaxes back is what we measure. Mm -hmm. And you can yeah. measure that in different ways. So it behaves yeah. like a spinning cup. It, like I, I yeah, don't think it's a molecule it, though. So not an atom. Yeah, no, 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 no. It, it is not an electron. electron. It is a yeah. proton. <coughs> proton. We'll yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. But like specifically within molecules, I mean, more like we, we try to measure the different relaxation of yeah, the protons to know the different molecules. But this is like even deeper. That's like the right for electrons, protons, well, their charge is different. It, it's about charge. And I I don't think if we could like shrink ourselves down and look at it, it would it would look exactly like spin. I think that's just how we set line. But I could be wrong, I'm not sure. I just read that so yeah, but the machine learning wise it's, it's like uh, it looks article like Chris Moore I knew uh yeah. proved some of the bonds uh he did actually. He proved some of the bounds on short complexity. Oh, right? No, it's like short general, general, not general, like quantum, quantum uh, complexity classes. So, so some of that is not yet proven. That I know. You don't actually. The comment about loading up the problem into the quantum computer may cost you as much as already solving it on a classical computer. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the no free lunch. Uh, it's like, yeah, it will solve it fast, but you will spend on reading and writing. Uh, it's like a GPU. <laughs> yeah. Sending it to the GPU to launch a kernel can be yeah, slow yeah, 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 yeah. on the GPU. Unless the world becomes one huge GPU. Exactly. And yeah. We live in it. <laughs> this is the future of computers. It's just, it's just GPUs. Yeah. So what do you yourself think the future of this? Is it like, the, you also mentioned an analog computer that uh, Sounds computer. like a term of place to use. Uh, well, well, in classic computer, computers, yeah. I think analog computers can be compared to those uh, specialized chips, the IBM or NVIDIA doing for neuromorph computers. Quantum computers can be compared to or equated to the specialized chips. Uh, you can create well, specialized chips design is created to uh, solve a specific problem efficiently. GPU. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say that though. I think GPUs are very general. That's actually the main general processing unit. I mean, graphical processing. We're talking about <laughs> you know, like, what? graphical graphics. Processing. It's not general. No, they're, they're also people also call them general processing units. They, no, they're graphics. <laughs> no, I know, I know. But like NVIDIA internally also uses the just like general. Graphics. They used to have GGBU lingo, general graphical. Well, I mean, more like what he's talking about is literally like designing a circuit for a specific problem though. that's like a million times faster than a GPU can ever be. Like, it's like. And you can do that with analog computers, just yeah, by basic. connecting yeah, wires so, yeah, and so, transistors. ASIC chips is kind of like normal computers, right? Except you're trying to make them more general. Yeah, then more generally, you can still program, right? Or like you can think about FPGAs and things like that. But uh, I mean, even like. Yeah, no, but FPGAs are also really slow compared to ASICs. They are what? They're super slow compared to ASICs. But ASICs are FPGAs. No, no. FPGAs are reprogrammable, ASICs are not. ASICs are just a circuit. Yeah, but it's it's only the physical technology that they build on but the principle is the same right? no because uh, asics you have to design the whole circuit and then mass produce it and fpgas you can reprogram the circuit every time you want to run it which is yeah that's different. the only difference so they well, but once you <laughs> once you program the circuit it is like as if you no fpgas are much slower than normal circuits yeah, yeah. Design. because they allow you to reprogram right like, but i think that's a huge difference though that's why FPGAs are used in conjunction with the GPU sometimes in computers because you can use them to reprogram for your own purposes during computation, but you can't do that with ASICs. Uh, just so for the record, so not to argue, mm -hmm. but for the record, what I mean they are the same is it's like you make a um, set of channels where you pour water mm -hmm. and the, the water flows in those channels 
comes together that get creates uh, higher flow, uh, more throughput channel. And you have two systems. One is tilted like 30 degrees and another one is tilted one degree. So the water slow, uh, flows slower here, the water flows faster here, but the principle is exactly the same. So that's what I mean when you program a PGA, the current flows, it's like a circuit. It is a, like it is a circuit in uh, ASIC, you just like streamline. You are constrained though. Uh, a little bit with by physics, yeah, yeah. By, well, I mean, the FPGA, I think, cannot do every operation that an ASIC can, like, because it's just you're limited. But yeah, I mean, FPGAs are like amazing and awesome. Well, but I mean, they're I think like neural morphic computers are more similar to like ASICs, although they are trying to make them more general than ASICs, which are literally like very specific. That'd be a cool talk to somebody here when he was just the neural morphic computers on the weekend. Yeah. Neuromorphic computing is very cool. Because yeah, but still, like, it's not analog. analog. Still, it's uh, not analog. Analog will be even faster. Is not neuromorphic going towards analog? That's what they're trying. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But that's also why I'm saying it's similar to ASIC. ASIC is completely analog, right? Is it? Yeah, it is. It's just a circuit, literally a circuit. So, like, there is no it, digital. It is also literally just an object in the universe. Right. It says input and output. Yeah, that's very helpful yeah. comment. No, I think. Yeah, but okay, well, no, th this is very interesting because we need new modes of computation. We kind of stuck. We know also, we read this, all, well, we didn't discuss it in this uh, reading group, but we all read that paper about how hardware influences the success of the models whatever is efficient hardware, whatever models we develop, if they adhere or kind of uh, absorb the efficiency of that hardware, then, you know, they will. That's the new paradigm. I mean, deep learning wouldn't exist without GPUs, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, or something like GPUs. Yeah. Sorry, I meant ASICs are not analog, but uh, neuromorphic computing is. I'm just saying that currently, yeah, sorry, yeah, I mean, I said it the wrong way, but neuromorphic computing currently, because it's so specific to the task, right, it's like very much like, you can't really do anything else than the specific task that they did with it. So analog will be faster, right? Yeah, it's it would like, be faster. But faster. Solve only one problem, but. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, currently, they're trying to make it broader, right? Like, but it's making it programmable, I don't even know how. Right? Yeah, that's very hard. You have to run, well, Back to the Markram's movie about Markram, right? You have to run the discussion after that. You have to run the software on top of that that can store your uh, program in in those uh, recurrent loops on the, on the fly. So it's analog, but uh, it makes digital on top of that. Uh, uh, any further comments, questions to Pavel or uh, just like? I had a question. So do you know which company is like have Forefront of the line of making quantum computers. Uh, I heard not about D Wave company. Where? D Wave. D Wave. D Wave. They, did, did Google buy one of their yeah, quantum computers? Google tried to improve their, one of their solutions. And I know Los Alamos has one. Uh, Sergey will know where it's from. Is it from D Wave? No, I don't know. Um, there was a group when I was there. There was a group uh, called Quantum Computing and Biophysics Group was that was working on, but there was no computers yet. It was kind of a because I, I thought that's what Garrett has been doing. Right? Well, then Robin may know. Yeah, yeah, she like, he he's in that. Group. I don't know what it's called now. Yeah. Also, yeah, I meant general purpose GPU. I knew I'd read it about it somewhere because I was doing a course on high performance computing and they just only talk about like general purpose GPUs. But they're not general purpose, right? No, 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 I know, but this is like the stream. Well, this is what they call it in Nvidia. Yeah, that, that's that's Nvidia, right? Uh, there's some marketing in it. Well, no, but it's like the idea that now a lot of things have been taken over by the GPU generally, not just graphical. Like uh, right, they're trying to integrate more things onto the GPU instead of the CPU. That's the idea of the GP, GPU uh, pipeline. I talk about that in the podcast that I went on Tuesday, <laughs> but I talk about a different you did an interview for a podcast. Uh, actual podcast, there's a local. I want to listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I embarrass myself. So <laughs> one thing is just, you know, 
but yeah, it's I'll, I'll send a link. Yeah, when it's uh, when they. <laughs> uh, but I talk about it in the following way that um, if you can, it's the same comment that they just made about hardware. But it's like MATLAB. When we were all doing MATLAB, uh, if you can cast your problem in matrix multiplication form and linear algebra form, it will perform like super efficient, uh, very cool. The same with G, uh, G, P, G, P use. If you cast it, if you can cast your problem, but it's on you to cast that in that form of matrix vector multiplication. No, absolutely. You can't like do the loops and things like that. It's not built for that. Well, I actually read a really interesting post also about the fact that like the uh, the tensor thing that DeepMind just posted, by the way, is not as impressive as it seemed. Turns out they only went from 98 to 96 and then a day later, to oh, well, like Austrian guys were like, "Oh, we can actually do." That. I watched Slack, man. I'm <laughs> saying, no, no, it was really fun. But like, actually, someone made a blog post saying like the most interesting thing that I think about that <laughs> paper is the fact that they were able to reformat that problem as a game. That's more interesting to me than the whole fact that Alpha Tensor is able to solve it, which I agree with. Like the fact that they can map it to a problem like that that can then be solved by something like Alpha Fold or whatever. Well, maybe there is some kind of um, a relationship with quantum computing. It's like if you can, or um, Andre Karpath's uh, software 2.0. If you can formulate your problem as something that neural network can do, then okay, you can just train the network. Or uh, if you can uh, uh, load your data into quantum computer, <laughs> then the quantum computer. <laughs> right. Okay. By the way, maybe Google also is something like general operation. Oh, oh. I, I mean, no, I'm, I'm actually talking about I like did a class on high performance computing. Like I'm talking about this is like not like a, a niche thing. I know GPUs don't stand for general purpose. I know they're, <laughs> I mean, obviously, I'm, but I'm just like talking about there is like the idea that GPUs have become general purpose. Like they used to only be able to do graphics. Obviously, that's not true anymore. Like that's what NVIDIA and stuff are moving toward because selling just for video games yeah, is not so what they're really. This is an interesting on. rant in like I like it that we have about three minutes, well, two minutes uh, of how it's like you um, we're making groups that becoming deeper, deeper, and uh, at first they help us to move uh, all as society, as engineers, as scientists, but then we're kind of uh, get stuck in those groups, but. What you're talking about, I think, can be also traced backwards in time to Fortran and to developing a LAPAC efficient matrix multiplication. Mm -hmm. Once we got those algorithms, now we don't have to think that that hard how to parallelize an algorithm because we we like I, like we as not like those people who actually work on parallel algorithms, but as users, I will be unable to parallelize anything. It's like the, the hardware is so complicated. The only way I know is cast it into the matrix multiplication, which is already parallelized and all the critics are. And uh, I know I'm not like, well, thanks to Alex Smola for his blog post. He, uh, there is a blog post from the 2000s where he explains that like, no, you won't be able to optimize it. It's just like, it takes many years to optimize an algorithm to run parallel hardware. Yeah. Just cast it into the linear algebra problem and then it's already optimized. And then, oh, we have hardware for that well, because Etc. So because graphics is being in right, yeah, yeah. But maybe there is a hardware somewhere unborn yet uh, in platonic world that is fit for LSTMs and recurrent networks that runs them the best and everything. Well, I think I think analog uh, hardware would be much better. For yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you have to build one LSTM, uh, yeah, uh, one one PhD. Degree for one list. <laughs> like I think some of the PhDs for one <laughs> list. Yeah, but I guess in the current state. Well, it, it took two, right? It took Alex Graves and Hawk Ryder. It yeah. took two. two. Yeah, but I'm talking about designing the hardware. Oh, yeah, that was probably already five PhDs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, well, thanks everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed us, uh, our discussion about nothing, uh, but uh, thanks to Pavel about substantial presentation. Uh, yeah. uh, we're stopping here.